The Times Higher Education Ranking for 2022 is now out. It goes through, supposedly, the best universities in the world, and one can also dissect it by country if you want to do so. It purports to tell you where you should spend your hard-earned money or potentially where you should incur student debt to go and study. I'm going to go through this ranking, give you an idea about what they propose are the best universities in the world, and whether the ranking even makes any sense. And it turns out it's one of the better rankings out there, but it certainly is not perfect. And there is definitely room for improvement. But like I said, it's not total rubbish, and there are absolutely worse rankings than the Times Higher Education one. Now, on the top of education and the like, I've developed a course on corporate valuation, so if you're interested in stocks or trading or in various financial instruments, go check out that course. It teaches you how you'd value a stock or how you'd value a company. And that's obviously important if you want to go out and trade or potentially if you wanted to go out and study finance. Now, with that preamble out of the way, let's have a look at the ranking. So what we've got here is we have our rankings. Now, the top 10 are not totally weird, so in general anyway. So the first one here is University of Oxford. To some extent, that's not super surprising given that Times Higher Education is a UK website. Then we've got Caltech, which to my mind is a weird second place, then Harvard, then Stanford, rounding out our top four. Now, continuing on from our top four, we've got Stanford, then Cambridge, MIT, Princeton, UC Berkeley, Yale, and then University of Chicago. Now, in that top 10, it's not a terrible top 10, but certainly there is weirdness that we can immediately see. For example, most people would not necessarily regard Oxford as being better than Harvard or Yale, for example. That's the first thing, both in terms of research output, but also intuitively. And we'll get at some issues with the ranking in a second. Furthermore, you've got some highly specialized institutions. For example, Caltech, number two here, but it really is quite specialized. So that again is another piece of weirdness. So we're seeing already some strange items within the ranking in the top 10. If you go down throughout the rest of the top 20, we've got Columbia, which makes sense. Imperial, again, very good. John's, John Hopkins, specialized, but probably within that specialization, it's probably so good that maybe makes sense that it's here. And they have broadened their offerings. UPenn, ATR Zurich, Peking, Tsinghua, Toronto, and UCL. And then we've got UCLA as number 20. So effectively, that's what we're seeing in our top 10 here, or top 20 rather. Now we're seeing a bit of geographic dispersion, although that's primarily split between the US, the UK, and to some extent China with Tsinghua and Peking. Now the thing to bear in mind here is that there is some geographic bias in their ranking. For example, when looking at things like citations, they do in fact try to normalize it by country. Normalizing by country is weird because clearly you just want to look at citations. It doesn't really matter where things are from, but that's another issue entirely. And I'll get to the ranking later on. So that's what we're seeing in terms of our top 20. Now, what I'll do is I'll break it down by country to see what the top 10 in each country that you might be considering studying in might be. So to do this, we can filter our list in, uh, in the rankings here. So we can filter it by country. So just in no particular order, I'll go with Australia first. Now, with Australia, again, the ranking is broadly sensible, but not totally consistent with some other ones. So ARWU, for example, ranks things slightly differently. Nevertheless, we're seeing Melbourne as the top university in Australia, ANU, which in many other rankings has actually fallen quite a bit, UQ, which is weird, Monash, UCID, and then UNSW. Now, in broad terms, this is not a terrible ranking in terms of the top five or so in Australia, but there is some weirdness. For example, in some rankings, UNSW Sydney actually exceeds University of Sydney. So again, that relative ranking is unusual. Monash University, again, is often within this same vicinity. UQ would strike me as weird that is up there. And that seems to be held up primarily by things like medicine. ANU in most rankings has fallen. So Times appears to be a little bit inconsistent with some other rankings, but not so egregiously inconsistent that it is a major problem. So that's what we're seeing in terms of the top universities in Australia. After UNSW, we've got Adelaide, then Western Australia, then UTS, then Canberra, and then we've got Macquarie. 
So that's what our top ones in Australia are. We can also have a look at, for example, the United Kingdom. Now, in terms of the United Kingdom, we've already seen some of this. The United Kingdom has Oxford, then Cambridge, which is relatively unsurprising. Then Imperial, that again makes sense. Then UCO, then LSE. Now, LSE is a weird one here because LSE is super specialized. So one can argue about whether it really should be ranked this highly or not. Then we've got Edinburgh and then King's College. Now, I dare say that with Edinburgh and King's College, these are perhaps ranked higher here than they would be in many other rankings. A curious thing with LSE is that London Business School is also not here. That's weird because London Business School is a highly ranked business school. The reason it's excluded is they exclude any institution that does not offer undergraduate degrees. LBS only offers graduate degrees. That means that it's automatically excluded, which creates inaccuracies in this ranking. I think that's something that they should definitely fix up for future rankings, because it makes no sense you would exclude LBS or INSEAD, for example. So that's what we're seeing in the United Kingdom. We can also look at the United States. Now, the United States is a very common destination for people to study overseas. So again, we're seeing Caltech, then Harvard, Stanford, MIT, Princeton, UC Berkeley, Yale, uh, University of Chicago, and Columbia. Now, as an aside, if you're an international student, there's no way you would choose UC Berkeley over, I don't know, Columbia or Yale, uh, for example, but it's, it's weird that they've done that ranking. Then you've got Johns Hopkins, UPenn, UCLA, Cornell, then Duke, then uh, University of Michigan and Arbor. There are several different locations for Michigan, Northwestern, NYU, and then U University of Washington. University of Washington here is strangely significantly lower than it is in ARWU, for example. So we're seeing some deviations from other rankings as well. And in broad terms, the ranking makes sense mostly, but not entirely. And then we can see that once we're getting outside of our top 10, the ranking gets a little bit arbitrary and it's difficult to really tell whether one university is really better than others. So that's what we're seeing with, with the United States. So overall, that gives you an idea about which universities are placing well in the Times education list. Now, the question, of course, is, does this ranking actually make any sense? To determine whether it makes any sense, we can, of course, intuitively think, do we agree with this ranking? But then our own intuitive biases might come into play. For example, I have a degree from Leiden, so I would automatically think Leiden is probably a little bit better than other Dutch universities. Certainly for some fields, such as law, it potentially is. But for other fields, it might not be. Similarly, regardless of which university you studied at, you might have a different view. Now, for us to dissect whether the ranking makes any sense, we need to look at the methodology. Now, rather thankfully, they provide their methodology in a reasonable degree of detail. There's a few components to the methodology. We've got teaching, research volume, then citations, then international outlook, and then industry income. Now, let's dissect each of these in turn. In terms of the teaching aspect of it, the teaching aspect makes sense to include. Teaching is important within universities, and it certainly is a factor that is going to influence people's perception of that university. How, however, they rank teaching is a bit of an issue. The reason it's an issue is the good 15% overall of the overall university ranking is coming from teaching reputation survey. A reputation survey, to my mind, is totally meaningless. It simply is going to reflect people's prepackaged biases. So if they went to a university, they'll be biased toward it. If they know people from the university, they'll be biased toward it just due to familiarity. They might be biased negatively, but more likely positively due to just sheer name recognition. And if you recognize the name of a university or have seen it around, you're more likely to rank that university more highly. It could also be just due to the location you're in. You're going to end up with a reputation being potentially inflated. You also have the possibility that you might tank a rival institution. So reputation has a whole lot of biases, and it is not necessarily in any way reflective of either A, career outcomes, or B, teaching quality. Because career outcomes and teaching quality are the things that are the most important. So just preliminarily, we can see there's a huge issue there that is going to create significant biases within the ranking. What would be better here is if they did a career survey of some kind. 
either A, they got information from people who were employed, worked out where they're employed, what they're earning, what their job is based on the university they went to. An easy way to do this is you can go to LinkedIn and do some LinkedIn trolling. Alternatively, you can look at, in each market, the largest 50 country companies in the stock market or whatever it is. Determine how many directors and CEOs come from a particular institution. That would give you a better idea than simply looking at reputation. Because here, you'd have a, a clear outcome from the education, as opposed to simply going, do I think an educational institution is good? Here you can see whether there is a strong outcome. That would be a better approach to doing it. The ARW here primarily focuses on whether graduates have gotten things like Fields Medals and the like. I don't regard that as being the most valid way to do it. Once you look at professional outcomes, and they're clearly not doing that here. The next ones primarily make sense. So the next ones here are sort of looking at things that could be indicators of teaching quality. So staff to student ratio, the number of doctorate staff has, et cetera. Now, those are generally going to make sense. One has to bear in mind that there's often gamesmanship at universities that causes these things to be grossly out of kilter. Nevertheless, assuming that everyone's games, gaming this the same way, is just going to upwardly inflate all of the scores across all universities. So if everyone's gaming it the same way, it doesn't really matter that much. Nevertheless, these other categories generally make sense. The institutional income one here also makes some sense, of course, in that knowing how much money you're making, I mean, that's reasonable, right? In that if you're not making any money, then people aren't going to you and your educational income outcomes are going to get worse because there's no money coming in. So that is going to be important as well. But it does create some biases. Uh, so it is worth bearing in mind that institutional income is going to be different across the United States versus Europe versus Australia versus China for different structural reasons. So it makes sense, but it's not perfect. So in ethos, the teaching assessment is fine but it's not perfect at the moment, and there could be some improvements to it. The next one is research volume, income, and reputation. I regard this as nonsensical, to be honest. We've got a reputation survey, which again, bakes in those biases I talked about before, potentially even more so, because academics might snipe at the institutions that their rivals at. For example, it's going to be super inflated and super biased, and it's just going to go, well, do I think that an institution is good reputation? But people aren't basing this on any hard information. They're just kind of guessing. And familiarity is going to come into play here. Intrinsic biases, what people saw in media publications, the social media strategy, all of these things are going to influence it, even though they have nothing to do with research quality. Now, granted, the institution's public presence and public profile is important. And that's important in terms of how people perceive the institution. But it doesn't tell you anything about research quality. And if you want a public perception ranking here, one can certainly include that as a separate percentage. But let's not kid ourselves into thinking that public perception is in any way the same as research reputation or quality. The next one is our research income. Again, makes some sense, comes down to things like grants and the like. My main objection to that is that Universities often look at this and they kind of are trying to get income from corporations. But the way this is perceived by academics is that it's effectively unpaid consulting. So no one wants to do this. This is more a problem with how universities behave than anyone else. In that if one is really going to maximize research income, universities need to give academics a cut of the slice of the revenue coming in. Otherwise, there's no incentive. But that's another issue entirely. Then we've got research productivity, which is basically just the number of publications appearing in an Elsevier index journal. Pointless, because pumping out 10 low quality publications is infinitely easier than publishing one high quality publication. So research volume is so totally meaningless it shouldn't be here. So overall, I have misgivings about this whole section here. I would regard that as being surplus to research quality and this could sometimes or potentially be rolled in to the research citation aspect, which we'll get to, and potentially expanding the citations as well. Uh, perhaps expanding the citations to include other measures of research quality. So that then leads us on to research citations or research influence as our next criteria. 
Now, research citations are getting at the idea of, well, how often have these articles been cited? It's field normalized and supposedly country normalized. Makes sense. No real particular negative comments about this. I just highlight that when you're looking at citations, you should look at this and not, uh, not weight it or not um, discount it for the number of people at that institution. Because in terms of research quality, you care about the total number of citations as opposed to necessarily how many citations there are per person. Because then you end up with this weird situation that you can't PhD students, you can't postdocs, you can't fractional people. It's just better to look at it overall. But nevertheless, citations make sense. I don't have terribly much else to say about this. It could be improved at the margins, but it's broadly sensible. Then our next major category is international outlook. I regard this again as being nonsensical. The reason this is nonsensical is international outlook should itself be an outcome, a leader to an outcome, sorry. So you care about international outlook so far as it leads to better outcomes. And collaborating overseas should enable you to produce better research outcomes. Getting international students adds to the student body. Getting, and will add to employment outcomes. Getting international staff, again, should add to teaching quality and also add to research quality. So here what you care about is the end, not the means. So I don't think this should even be part of the ranking. And it shouldn't be part of the ranking because we should be concerned about the outcomes. The outcomes in terms of student outcomes, so student success. Outcomes in terms of research success. We shouldn't care per se whether there are international co-authors in a publication. We should care about the quality of the publication. So I would regard this as being surplus and kind of pointless, to be honest. Then in terms of industry income, again, same type of thing I mentioned before in terms of income. Again, it makes sense, but universities need to bear in mind that they shouldn't be doing what is effectively paid consulting or unpaid consulting, sorry, for academics, because there's no incentive to do that. Then, as I mentioned before, there are some exclusions. Those exclusions primarily pertain to universities that don't do undergraduate degrees. So that's effectively what we're seeing in terms of the methodology. So the methodology overall does make sense. It's not the worst methodology out there. It's generally more sensible than, for example, the ARWU, which has some arbitrary and slightly uh, nonsensical biases towards specific outlets and specific awards. I regard the Times Higher Education ranking as more meaningful than, say, the ARWU. Nevertheless, there is room for improvement. It's not perfect, it's better than many others, and it could be improved, but it does give us an idea about which universities are performing well. So that's a bit of a summary about the Times Education Ranking. I hope it's given you some idea about how they rank universities, about which universities are the best in the world according to their ranking, and I hope it gives you some insight into how that ranking could be improved and some of the caveats you need to consider when evaluating any of these university rankings. Now, if you have any thoughts about the ranking, let me know those in the comments below. And otherwise, it would be great if you check out my corporate valuation course, if you're interested in finance and stock valuation and the like. And regardless, I very much hope to see you for future videos as well. Bye.